What's going on, smart people? Everyone has solved the one-dimensional infinite square well problem. You have a particle confined between points A and B where it can move freely in one dimension, and then outside of those points, the particle has zero probability of popping up, kind of like it's in a box with infinitely tall walls. Today, we're going to be focusing on a very, very similar potential, but one that gets much less love and recognition the semicircular well or the semicircular ring potential. It goes by many names. But basically, instead of the particle moving back and forth like this, it's confined to moving in a semicircular ring in between, say, zero and pi. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. So we've got a particle that is confined to moving along some like semicircular wire, which tells us that the distance between the particle and the center of that semicircle is going to be a constant. So the only variable in all of this is going to be some angle that we'll call phi. And we're assuming that the potential, it's not pulling or pushing on the particle in between our interval from zero to pi. So let's go ahead and write all of this out. So for this, it's going to make sense to write everything in terms of, you know, uh, cylindrical polar coordinates. So we'll say that our potential of phi is equal to, well, it's going to be very similar to the infinite square well, right? It's going to be zero for our angle in between zero and pi. So it's just saying that the particle is not feeling anything if it's inside this interval and it's infinite else. So the particle has no chance of being found outside of this semicircular well. So if we wanted to draw this out, here's v as a function of phi, here's zero, here's pi. Uh, it has no chance of being found in this region, so this is infinitely high. We'll call this region 1. So the wave function at region 1 should be 0. At pi, we have kind of infinitely tall wall here, so that equals infinity. And we'll call this region 3. And similarly, the wave function in this region should be equal to 0. And this just means the wave function being 0 means you know we have no probability. The wave function, the particle has no probability of being found here or here. So the only interesting part is in this region 2. This is what we're going to be solving for. So since we have something that only depends on phi, our Laplacian that is in terms, our Hamiltonian that is in terms of the Laplacian will write in terms of cylindrical coordinates. And since phi is the only variable, this simplifies our Schrodinger equation. Normally we would have h bar squared over 2m del squared psi plus v times psi is equal to e psi. Uh, but we're not working in three dimensions, we're only working in one, so we can just write down the angular part of the Laplacian and cylindrical coordinates, which is going to give us a minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over s squared, uh, d squared over d phi squared times psi. And since we're establishing that we're only looking in this region, the potential here is zero, so this is just equal to e times psi, because this part is zero. Uh, and keep in mind, this, this thing here, this is a constant. This isn't a variable. Our wave function does not depend on s. It only depends on uh, our angle. And in different literature, you might see people absorb this ms squared into the moment of inertia for a semicircular ring. We're just going to keep it along for the ride for now. Um, so let's go ahead and move this e over. We're just going to start solving the Schrodinger equation. So we've got, and we're also going to multiply this h bar squared over 2m over as well. So we've got 1 over s squared, uh, psi double prime, phi. Um, so that's going to be a plus 2me over h bar squared, psi is equal to 0. Let's create a variable, the standard variable for this term right here, this 2me over h bar squared. That we're just going to call k squared is equal to 2me over h bar squared. And then let's go ahead and multiply this s squared over. So we've got psi double prime uh, plus k squared s squared psi is equal to 0. And this looks exactly uh, like the differential equation we would solve for the regular infinite square well. We've just got our second derivative of the function plus something that is proportional to the function equaling zero. Uh, we know we have like periodic boundary conditions. So we've got psi of zero is equal to psi of pi is equal to zero. 
right? Because the wave function has to be continuous here, and the only way for that to happen, if it can't be found out here, if our particle can't be found out here, is for the wave function at our boundaries to vanish, which gives us these boundary conditions. So we've got periodic boundary conditions. We've got our textbook periodic, you know, differential equation. We know our answer is going to be in terms of sines and cosines, but just for, for good measure, just for completeness, let's guess that our wave function can be written psi is equal to e to some value lambda times phi. Then its second derivative is equal to lambda squared e to the lambda phi. And we can substitute our ansatz into our differential equation and we get lambda squared e to the lambda phi uh, plus k squared s squared e to the lambda phi is equal to zero. Factor out our exponential e to the lambda phi times lambda squared plus k squared s squared is equal to zero. This exponential is never going to be zero for any phi or lambda that we put in here. So the thing that must make this zero has to be this argument here. So we're saying that lambda squared plus k squared s squared equals zero. So lambda is equal to plus or minus i k s. Cool, so we found something that works. So our solution will be a linear combinations of these pluses and minuses which is going to give us uh, psi of phi is equal to some constant times cosine of ks phi plus some other constant times the sine of ks phi. Okay, I'm going to erase this work just to give myself a little bit more space because now we can uniquely determine the wave function up to a phase by imposing our boundary conditions, which are right here. I'm just going to erase this, this stuff. Okay, so our boundary conditions say that the wave function at the origin should be zero. So if we plug that in, is equal to, well, this term goes to zero, so that works. Uh, but cosine of zero is one, so we get that this is equal to a. And for this to equal zero, a must equal zero. Great, so now we know that psi of phi is equal to some constant b times the sine of ks phi. Now we can apply the second boundary condition, but the second boundary condition doesn't fix what b has to be. The second boundary condition fixes what this combination has to be. So we're saying that psi of pi has to equal zero, which is equal to b sine of ks pi, and this argument makes the sine zero if ks has to be some integer. So we'll go ahead and call ks is equal to some integer n. Okay, so this is equal to, so now we have psi of phi is equal to b times the sine of n times phi. Perfect, we're almost done. The last thing that we want to do is we want to find out what this b is, and we can fix this exactly through normalization of the wave function. So if we demand that one is equal to the, uh, this normalization constant b squared times the wave function squared, well, this is part of the wave function, but you get what I mean, sine squared of n phi d phi, and this is going from zero to pi. Okay, well, sine squared is just one half, one minus cosine of two theta. So this is equal to uh, zero to pi of b squared times one half of one minus cosine of two n phi d phi. Okay, well the first integral, we can split this up into two integrals, this is gonna be equal to b squared, b is just a constant, I can pull it out of the integral, times the integral of one half d phi from zero to pi, uh, minus b squared integral from zero to pi over two of one half cosine of two n phi d phi. Integral of cosine is going to give us something that's proportional to sine, and the sine of 
an integer times pi is going to give us zero, and the sine of an integer times zero is going to be zero. So this integral, integral, this integral is just zero, which tells us that uh, one is equal to, well, the integral from zero to pi of this is just going to give us a pi halves. So we've got b squared times pi over two. We get that b is equal to the square root of two over pi. So now I'm just going to erase this and write our final solution uh, right somewhere. So our final solution becomes psi as a function of phi is equal to root two over pi times the sine of n phi. And then you can plug in our values for n if you'd like, but n was defined, n is equal to ks and k is equal to the square root of 2me over h bar squared. Uh, so this is just equal to, so ks is equal to the square root of 2me over h bar squared times s, which is equal to the square root of 2ms squared e over h bar squared. And ms squared is just the moment of inertia again, so this is just the square root of 2i times e over h bar squared. So this is just going inside of our sine function there. And the last thing that we can do is we can find our energy eigenvalues. And I'm going to solve for them in terms of n, which means that I'm going to subscript our energies with a, with a little n index. So e sub n, just solving for it, is going to give an n squared times h bar squared over 2 times the moment of inertia. So we get something that is extremely similar to the infinite square well. Then I have indexed our psi with a little n to denote that we're talking about the nth eigenstate. And the last thing that I want to discuss real quick before wrapping up is the dimensions of the wave function, something people normally don't talk about. Um, if we take a look at this, you know, root 2 over pi, that's dimensionless. Sine of n pi, that's dimensionless. So our wave function, all in all, is dimensionless. But if we think about the infinite square well in Cartesian coordinates, where we just have one dimensional motion back and forth in say the x direction, our wave function, our nth eigenstate as a function of x, is you know, root 2 over L, assuming we're going from 0 to L, times the sine of n pi x over L. The sine, yes, this is dimensionless, but root 2 over L, L has units of maybe meters, and that means that this has units of one over the square root of meters. So these things have different dimensions, even though they're describing, are they describing the same thing? Are we just representing it different? Is this a big deal? And the answer is no, because what matters is that the inner product, the sum of the probabilities of our wave function should equal one. This is what needs to be dimensionless. So the fact that our wave functions in different representations have different units, that's fine. Because remember, if we're doing this integral, this here is an integral where we're squaring effectively our wave function. This is saying we're doing two over L times the integral of sine squared of n pi x over L times dx. So our, our dimensions of length end up canceling, so to speak. So we get something at the end that is dimensionless. So the fact that our wave functions have different, uh, different units in different representations is fine. This is the thing that sum of the probabilities equaling one being dimensionless is the thing that should always be preserved. So with that being said, I'm gonna wrap this video up. Hope you found it interesting and a little bit helpful. I don't think this is a potential that most people end up solving, even though it's basically the same thing. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.